Hello friends, welcome back to another exciting and inspiring and fun episode of On Location with Zara. I'm your host Zara Durrani. The show is produced with the support of Tell a Story Hive. It has been my absolute pleasure to bring so many inspiring locals on the show here, feature their stories and hopefully you found them inspiring and moving just as much as I did. Today, I'm so excited to have with me someone whose story has really inspired me. This is take two of our interview right now, folks. And But I do believe that we're going to really dig deep here with this inspiring human being who has traveled the world. You know, he's defied a lot of odds and he is, I feel like a beacon of hope, you know, for so many people. And he is on the verge, my friends. He's on the verge of going to the Paralympics, uh, Summer Olympics taking place in Paris anytime soon. When do you find out? When is when is the date? The scheduled date is still up in the air. Up in the air. We're up gonna the find, air, yeah, yeah. but we're gonna find out soon. You know, there's a reason why Nathan Clement is sitting here with Tourfell right in the back because the city of lights, love, and fashion is calling him. Uh, he is on the verge of being selected for his second Paralympics in a different sport. Nathan Clement has had a very unique journey. After suffering a stroke as a toddler, the odds were stacked against him to live a fulfilling and normal life. With support from his family and community, Nathan became a Paralympic swimmer at the Rio 2016 games where he placed seventh and captained his team. In 2020, Nathan switched to cycling. After biking across BC, he went to win the 2023 Trike One UCI Para Cycling Time Trial World, Champ World Championship and the 2023 Para Pan American Games title in the time trial. With Paris 2024 on the horizon, and his work in the community, developing para sports through media and grassroots management. Nathan aims to create a bright future for people with disabilities. I wanted to make sure I share all this information with you because I've had the opportunity to sit here with him for the last hour and a bit and really talk about his journey, his story, and I hope you're going to find it as inspiring uh, as I did. And a few times, if I must say, I was moved to tears Nathan Klima, welcome. Do you speak French? I don't at all, no. I know it's terrible, it's terrible of me. It's a very French <laughs> last name, bonjour, mon <laughs> ami. It is bad. Like, ac actually, my family is a 12th generation French Canadian. Okay. So, I'm the really the first person in our family's lineage not to speak French, so I better learn it quick right now. Well, I'll tell you what you need to know. Bonjour, bonjour madame, bonjour monsieur, and like, un croissant s'il vous plaît. Et voilà, c'est bon. Un croissant s'il vous plaît. <laughs> voilà! <laughs> well, welcome, welcome here. Thank you so much for your patience, for your time, for sitting here with us. Um, you know, we were talking earlier, Nathan, and I found something so striking what you were saying that you were told, your parents were told, you won't be able to walk to talk, to do anything. Mm -hmm. And look at you now. Look at you now. You are going around the world. You are an Olympic champion, you know, Paralympic champion. You swim. <laughs> I don't even know how to swim. <laughs> I grew up in Pakistan, you know, in the city that I'm from. We, um, there were no beaches. There were, there were a swimming pool. I think I've taken a few swimming lessons when I was a little baby, but I don't know, it just, just never happened. Where does that come from, this, dr this drive, this inner ambition and fire to go against these odds? It comes from a lot of things, but firstly, thank you for having me here today and having me on today. But that drive and energy very much comes from my mom and my dad. Uh, when I had the stroke at the age of two and a half, as you said, I was told pretty well I would never live a normal, fulfilling life, whatever that means at the end of the day. But for myself, from that moment of the stroke, my parents had a dark cloud over their heads. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to support it. <laughs> hey, Danny. 
Lily. <laughs> Lily wants to make sure she is known. Yeah, but I didn't really. My my parents didn't really know what to do. Mm -hmm. But supports the community, like the United Way and the BC Center for Ability, took my parents in, took me in, had me play games, play activities as a toddler at the age of two and a half. I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you what was happening at all. I think Lily wants to jump in and I'm going to just pause right here. And we are going away, my sweet, sweet child. We're going to go away. <laughs> Today's just one of the days, you know? Lots of surprises. Okay. Would you want me to pick up from anywhere? Um, yeah, if you can just pick back up with the United Way and... Okay. Yeah. For my parents, they had that dark cloud over their head, but organizations like the United Way and the BC Center for Ability came in and very much with the BC Center for Ability, for example, being told that you can't walk, read or write, or even losing a lot of that function, like when I first had my stroke, was extremely difficult. So they set up a lot of games with the occupational therapists I had and the speech therapists I had, where I'd be running through tunnels, I would be crawling up and down different ladders, different play sets and different jungle gyms, and also blowing bubbles, playing games like, what time is it, Mr. Wolf, like a vocal game. So I'd be yelling, I'd be screaming, I would be laughing. And for me, as a kid at that age, I just thought it was an hour, two hours of fun. Play just time. having a blast, mm -hmm. hanging out with my, my therapist, like Johanna and Morway. But little did I know that I was actually regaining function of my left arm, mm -hmm. regaining function of my left leg, and learning to speak, learning to move my mouth muscles, learning to help my vocal cords out. And from afar, my parents were seeing this. They were seeing their kid that got told the worst news that he was smiling, he was laughing, he was excited for when the therapist came over to the house or they went to the center. He he was having fun and that brought hope to them and mm -hmm. i think starting from there it gave them that confidence that i can do pretty well anything but there was definitely hurdles and even being a kid being very young suffering a stroke and trying to figure out okay i'm different from this person over there why is that why can't i use my arm why can't i use my mm -hmm. leg as great as these other people around me was especially challenging at first, but my parents just kept throwing me into different situations. Sink or swim moments, and at first, very challenging, very difficult and taxing for me, but also for them. But as time went on, that power of community and that, that support I originally had from the United Way, the BC Center for Ability, but also when I joined my first soccer team, I had a coach, John Lucky, who, gave me chances to play, gave me chances to be out there and get out there and put myself in moments that maybe a lesser coach or someone who was not as, not thinking fully would not put me in, but this was a team where we, we went undefeated my first season. We didn't lose a single game, but there I was out on the field while a lot of these kids could run circles around me, but my coach was giving me the opportunities to try, mm -hmm. to play and learn. And just having that help me learn anything I can do. I may not be the fastest, I may not be the strongest, but there's one thing I can be, and that's the hardest worker. Mm -hmm. And from there, and from the work that my mom, my dad, the foundations did for me, and coaches like John Lucky really helped propel me and chase dreams and chase the the uncomfortable spots, the uncomfortable zones that sport but also life brings in our everyday. Mm, that's so inspiring. Um, and when you're playing soccer, you're playing with like all the other kids. Yeah. But you're still, so may I ask like, when you would go home or you would be on the field, like I feel like what I'm getting a sense of when I speak to you and sit here next to you, that there is this spirit that, this resilient spirit that just won't break, that wants to keep charging ahead and continue to 
show what I'm capable of and perhaps inspire others and inspire yourself to be like, is, is that how you feel? Because I feel a lot of times for me, like the work that I do not being born in this country, like no one in my family does what I do and doing a lot of things that are very different from everyone in my family, but to make myself proud, you know, to show myself or the, like the little child within me, you can do this. You know, that even like when you talk about work ethic, that's exactly it. That you can't beat someone who won't give up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I had the privilege of talking to you off camera and just hearing your story, how you're a self-starter, how you've really tried to make it your own way. And of course, there's moments, there's days, there's weeks, there's months that where it feels like and it seems like don't know if I can get there I don't know if I can do this but you just keep pushing you keep working hard and some of the most admirable things is whether you get to that finish line you have it's that journey is that process that you had all along and even when I was a kid when I first joined that soccer team after my first practice I I didn't I did not have a good practice I could barely run let alone kick a soccer ball so actually as my mom, my dad, and I were leaving the field, John Lucky called my name out. And as we heard him call my name and started walking towards him, we thought we were going to have that conversation of, hey, it was great you showed up here, but this might not be the team for you. This might not be the environment. May I ask how old you were? I was nine, ten years old. Okay. So we were expecting that. However, John came over to us and said, hey, Nathan, you did a great job today. I want you to work on this drill. I want you to work on this. I want you to work on that. And I'll see you next week. And just having someone in that corner is huge, but also at times you may not have that. And I'm, I'm blessed. I'm so grateful for people like John in my life, but there's been so many other situations and you'll probably agree with me here too. It's where you don't have that person in your corner. And that only person is you. And you have to find a way through and it's almost trailblazing. It's almost mm -hmm. creating your own path, but it's a path that can hopefully open up for others to make those doors easier for others to get through. And those opportunities that you might struggle with now are going to be a lot easier for that next generation, that next person. And at the end of the day, that's all you can ask for sometimes too. Completely. I remember, I think it, this is like two decades ago, I was like, 20 something getting into modeling here and in Vancouver and you would barely see any billboard with anyone who was South Asian or Middle Eastern. Like that was just like unheard of. And then uh, anyone who looked like from my part of the world was just, you know, and so, so you internalize those things. But then there was something inside of me that, you know, when I would go for jobs or castings or whatever, they would want to see me for odd, things that you know I don't even want to talk about that you know I was like not even a name and just like this girl number this yeah. and and I just knew I had to go out there and create my own work because I was sick and tired mm -hmm. of being put in this category and I just didn't even know where to start you know so it's like it's been a lot of trials and tribulations and a lot of like moments by myself of like Am I crazy for wanting this or like the roller coaster of up and down? But you just keep going because you know there's a desire inside of you, this like fire that burns inside of you that wants to share stories, that wants to connect and communicate with people. Yeah. So, coming back to you, um, swimming. You know, how do you go from swimming as therapy? to you getting into it as a sport and then going to the Paralympics. Like, what a journey. Uh, I, I think for me, it really started out as, as someone who suffered a stroke, but also as somebody who acquired a disability. And I know I'm not the only one in these situations. What the water allows and what the water creates is movement, it's freedom, it's that ability to just be able to control muscles you would not maybe be able to control on land at least in my case and have a little bit more freedom and it's just I was very lucky I had great instructors 
uh, back at uh, the pool I was at and actually a funny full circle thing my one of my instructors I had at the pool turned out to be my first swim coach so it's funny how that full journey kind of went there and for me starting out doing lessons from the ages of three four five all the way till I was seven years old in 2001 where the pool I was at shut down for renovations I loved my lessons, I loved everything I was doing there, but pretty well when that happened in 2001, I was without the pool and I kind of lost it and kind of got separated for a little while till a friend in late 2008 invited me to go watch one of his swim competitions, mm-hmm. one of his swim meets for a high school race they had going on that weekend. So I went there and just when I got there, I saw my high school there and I kind of had a feeling was like, dang, I wish I brought a swimsuit. I wish I brought a swimsuit right now and I could hop in the water and race for my school because that was actually an opportunity I had at that competition. But I sat down with the coaches from my school and I asked them, hey, can I, can I swim? Can I swim for you all? And they were like, sure, we'll get you in at the practice next week and we'll just see how you go from there. And it's pretty well like, like a situation in soccer where I had everyone else just doing circles around me. I couldn't mm-hmm. keep up. I could barely keep myself above the water when mm-hmm. I first got in the water and first started training to do freestyle, training to do butterfly, training to do the main strokes. But I had coaches, I had supports who gave me that confidence and gave me that belief and gave their time selflessly to help support a teenager that was struggling at first and trying to figure out, okay, is this right for me? Is this something I can do? And that kind of belief from others and that support really helped prepare me to when I could swim, when I could race, when I could compete, to go outside of my comfort zones. Because like anything we do, you're gonna have your peaks, but you're also gonna have your valleys too. And they really tried to help teach me to ride the wave, ride the storm, because it's ever evolving and it's always ever changing. And just the whole journey of how swimming started to getting to go to Rio in 2016 and getting to race for Canada and getting to compete at the games was something so special because in Rio and even leading up to Rio, I was not supposed to be on that team. Hmm. They projected me just to miss the roster, but anything's possible on a race day and at the trials I qualified for Canada by fractions of a second Mm. I squeaked into my first Paralympic team but just being able to go is a gift being able to go is a privilege and that was so full full circle and amazing just even being able to be in a conversation of going to a games let alone going to one like Mm. that that's remarkable um, you were talking about like the peaks and valleys when you're going through that um, whether it is you know like placement or um, of course something you were mentioning earlier that it is a win just being there being part of the race and you know whether it's like we or somewhere else just showing up that is a major win and I completely agree even training you know defying so many odds like even that is a massive massive win but when you're going through those valleys, like what do you do for self-care? How do you get yourself out of that mindset of, um, you know, when you're questioning your decisions or you're questioning the path you're on or if you've had a tough day training and you're wondering, am I going to make it or not? And perhaps... You know, if you're anything like me, it's like I have moments of like feeling I'm on top of the world, everything is amazing to like very opposite voice, internal critic is turned on volume to the max and just the self criticism is through the roofs. So how do you deal with that inner critic or inner any kind of like, you know, voice that questions the path you're on? It's always tricky because often when a lot of us our biggest critics isn't our coach it isn't our parents it's isn't your friends it's yourself and sometimes because you're so internally focused on what you're doing you don't see that progress that you're making yourself on the outside that maybe others 
will notice right away or be able to pick up on. But one of the biggest things is I'm a very emotional person. So one thing I will try to do is not always hide my emotions at times, let myself go through these experiences, let myself be vulnerable with myself or vulnerable with others. Mm -hmm. As that is something very important as I've learned throughout my life as I struggled with mental health early as a teenager and as a young adult. But really, really being vulnerable, but also once the emotions start to settle, you really start to focus on, okay, what can I can control right now? Yeah, I had a bad day on the bike. Yeah, a piece of my bike's broken right now. But what can I control? Mm. Because me complaining, me whining about something is not going to make it magically appear, magically change. So it's doing things that matter to you. Like for myself, I know going for walks is important. So getting out on a nice summer's day like it is today in Vancouver, going down to a Kitts Beach, going to Granville Island or just going somewhere as I live in Kitsilano, live in the Kitsilano area. So I have these beautiful spots all around me, but also connecting with friends, connecting with something you're passionate about can be huge too, because everyone has little spots that they love in their own city, in their own community, or in their, in, in their own area. And just really trying to find what matters most to you in those moments and even disassociating from the problem at situations can be very huge and very vital and just helping yourself have that separation for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. 20 minutes, because it can be difficult at times when you're so goal driven, when you have a big vision of, I want to be doing this, I want to be doing that, I want to be a world champion, I want to be on this show, I want to be doing this and that, and sometimes it's so easy to get lost in that, and no one's perfect at the end of the day, and we all have moments where we do go through that, and it's tricky, but with time and with experience, you start to learn, okay, these are the needs that I need right now that I can follow. Mm. And sometimes that can be the biggest difference and the biggest separation, the biggest help in going through a lot of those emotions. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree about feeling your feelings. Like it's just so, like as a performer and teaching yoga and like in my journey over the years, I think it's like having a good circle doesn't mean it has to be a big circle, but people who do love and accept you, like a couple of days ago, which is Monday, today is Friday, when I decided I'm going to go to Paris and my inner critic was very loud. My fears were through the roof and, you know, insecurities and all of that. And when you see my social media, you're like, that is not the picture I see, but it's reality because I'm a human being like everyone else. I, you know, we all have these myriad of feelings and emotions which are so valid because I will never be the type of person who says that, oh, just focus on being positive all the time because that's sort of toxic spirituality. And, you know, I, I have this really great friend who is in film and television. She's an award-winning producer and we've had her on the show as a guest and you know I was just sharing with her what I was going through and that's our thought process what we do she lives overseas I'm here she's in Germany and you know I was just sharing what was on my mind and like later on she's like take it easy you're so tough on yourself and after two days of the challenges I finally decided to put it out there yes I am going to Paris and things positive things started happening I took time to sit on my balcony and journal and give myself permission to feel like what is the fear what are you afraid of instead of like running away from it and then just like you know getting through because so much of the work you guys do is you're challenging your body you know and and i'm sure there's days your body is like i don't want to go past this limit yeah i this is my limit like i, I i'm stopping here <laughs> you know? i don't want to go past this you know, and then getting upset, at, I, I'm speaking for myself, like, and if I get sick or whatever, because I'm pushing, I'm burning my, you know, the candle at all the ends, like, yeah. last time I was in Paris, first two days I was good, the whole time I was sick, but I had all this work to shoot, all these photo shoots to do, brands who'd already paid me, and it's my name, right? Yeah. And... I did above and beyond what they asked me because I know that is my name, yet at the same time, having self-care and compassion for myself. So this time around, I'm like, I gotta make that time. Like you can't, 
you gotta like <laughs> yeah. the balance of like overperforming and making yourself proud and then also it's it's such a fun, I mean you guys take it to world class level so you know you were mentioning earlier that for you like having them you know to disconnect from the work part the training part and like time to yourself is really important like do you meditate do you do do you, like watch movies other than walking like what are you doing to just like disconnect from the competing element I'll, I'll often I, I do watch movies sometimes but I also will like have baths I find like baths are so crucial just mentally just to space out whether it's like watching a tv show watching a movie or even uh on your phone just scrolling aimlessly giving your brain even though it's probably not the greatest thing in the world but just turning the brain off for 15 20 minutes can be huge but while you're like in a bath you're relaxing the muscles mm. the muscles are being relaxed and sometimes that can be quite soothing so just allowing yourself to have space away can be very very huge but um I'm going to throw the question back to you too is like when you've had like a busy day on set or just with like auditions or even being out in the community how do you reconnect with yourself and give yourself that space just to feel you again that's a great question um you know having a dog I have a dog and a cat and but with the dog Loki walking him and even if there have been times Nathan there's like a windstorm. It's snowing and the conditions are so bad and I'm not having a good day, but I have to walk in, rain or shine. And people will say to me or like post an Instagram story because they know I'm walking out. They're like, ha ha, I feel sorry for people walking their dog. But there have been times I'll be walking Loki and I'm just like having an emotional release and give, and then, you know, at the end of it, and I'm just push myself, walk the sea well, you know you're gonna feel better. Just one foot in front of the other, just go, just go. You're in a mood, you're gonna feel better. Listen to a podcast or just breathe. So what I do is like, just be with him, with my dog. Like it gets me to be present and like looking at water. Like, you know, it's such a privilege to live close to a body of water. I don't think I ever appreciated the natural beauty in British Columbia until coming back here from living in Paris. Because as gorgeous as Paris is and as much as I love it, there's a lot of man-made beautiful architecture. Yeah. Architecture that really inspires me, but when I see nature and when I hike up a mountain, my mind quiets down. And the higher I go up, the more like I'm sweating and my the racing thoughts, they stop and I'm breathing. And all I can just focus is on my breath. And then my reality, my nervous system is shifting. So I've had to realize like movement is just such a way of like changing my state of being. You know, I can choose to stay in this state where it is maybe low vibration or I can, you know, move my body and like, you know, take Loki to the dog beach, even though that's gonna take a long time to clean up. <laughs> <laughs> but go down to the dog beach and like um, see him run around and be with other dogs because that brings me back to the present yeah. instead of the mind, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's as you said, like when you started talking about that, it's the serotonin of being outside is so huge and so vital where we do have a lot of building structures here in Vancouver but we're also so close to the mountains so close to the ocean and even the dog parks are in great nature spots but something that you said that resonated with me too is like even though it might be a windstorm rain snow at least I found in my own life there's a calm in the storm that you can find no matter what it is whether it's literally a storm outside or you're presenting something on screen or you're racing in a big competition or you're just doing an audition there's those moments of anxiety those moments of nerves that just build up build up build up and it feels completely intolerable like like the world's about to end any second but as soon as you say that first word as soon as you say that first sentence or you hear that starting gun it is a calm 
Mm-hmm. And you were just in that moment and in that present time. And there's something so special about it. And just having like an animal, having a dog can really, or a cat can be really huge. I have a, I had a French bulldog who passed away last summer. Sorry but, to hear that. but just having her around and having her present was such a gift. And just dogs and even cats can be such kind and giving souls but most animals are that too and it's very vital and it's very beautiful that we have these things these commonalities like animals that can be a calming space but also we have our own specific things that just mean so much to us and that can be that little release that can be that way of getting it out there and really when you're in those moments and leading up to it, you don't really know what to expect, but once you do it, and there's even so many times that you probably will agree with me here, where you do something leading up to it, like a shoot or an audition or in a race that you're like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, mm-hmm. I don't want to go through this experience. Mm-hmm. But as soon as you do it, you're like, thank heavens I did that. Mm-hmm. Thank I'm so glad I did Mm -hmm. that because it turned out a lot better than I expected. Mm -hmm. And that's just so many journeys and so many different experiences that so many people go through. And it's a universal feeling. It's not like, it's just unique to us. So many people go through that and having those releases, having those space, or even getting those weights off can be so, so big at the end of the day. 100% is doing something that is not the comfortable thing to do yeah you know and then of course you take it to the next level like um so let's talk a bit about rio i know we were talking about rio 2016 um paralympics um you were mentioning earlier that moment you know and i was curious that what is it like to represent Canada and then you mentioned this moment in Rio you're in the pool and it's like 12 or 15,000 people in this uh, arena you know what would you call that and then there's someone from Brazil if you want to share that story again because I found that very I wonder if something like that would like almost create that fire inside me fine if there's like not enough people for me let me show you <laughs> yeah, yeah. so for myself uh qualifying for uh real in 2016 as i said before i wasn't expected to make that team let alone a final so in swimming the top eight athletes make finals from the prelim sessions in the morning i squeaked into finals by 0. 0.1 0. 0.2 of a second so there i was about to get ready for finals and I'm in the ready room with all the athletes in there and you've got guys and even girls in other heats who are expected medalists getting prepared getting ready and there I am just happy to be there just so overwhelmed and thrilled just to be in a moment like that and for myself being eighth and being seated eighth I was the first person to come out to the pool Mm. so kind of they give you a little cue in there, and as you start coming out, they announce your name, they put a photo of you on the big screen on the Jumbotron, and they put up your flag, so me being Canadian, the Canadian flag goes up there, and because I'm eighth, and obviously no one knows who I am, I get like a couple of claps, a couple of cheers from like teammates and my parents who were there, but it was super quiet, but right after me was a Brazilian, and as soon as that Brazilian flag went up on that screen, it just became deafening noise. 12,000 people screaming, Brazil, 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 Brazil. Because what they did, which was so cool at the Paralympic Games, was they lowered the ticket prices that allowed families to come. So you had... Every kid, uncle, auntie, neighbor, t- like kids, everyone. Kids too, yeah. teenagers mom dad the whole family came out there so it was it was almost like a college football atmosphere and there were like a brazilian soccer game that this football game atmosphere in there where it was so loud so deafening and as i was on the pool deck in lane eight i have low supports when i get ready to swim Mm. so because my hips aren't aligned properly Mm. i have a coach hold both of my hips just to make sure when i enter the water i enter the water properly so he was about the same distance you are from me Mm -hmm. And the noise is just so loud in there. And he's yelling at me. 
get down off the blocks, get down, get down, get down, because they have to delay our race because it's so loud in there. So I couldn't hear him at first, and eventually I find it, it finally clicked that I had to get down. But even then, it was just so difficult in that moment in time just because it was so noisy. And to give you another, uh, another real moment was a few days later, I was in a final, but for a relay. Mm -hmm. So kind of how relays work in para swimming or in a lot of other para sports is every athlete's in different categories. Like for example, in swimming, there's 14 categories in total. Mm -hmm. So you try, to, you try to have like all the different categories, try to make it as fair as possible. They equal different points. So for example, I was an S6. Mm -hmm. So I earned six points for Canada there and you had to get under a certain number threshold. So you would have like S10s for example. So you have like 16 total points and then maybe like another 10 and you're trying to get like under 38 points altogether. So it's, it can be very different how races line up. It's dependent. You may have an athlete who's a lot more physically able than another athlete going head to head in a relay space. Mm. So it can be ever changing. And kind of how Canada set up the race was I was the lowest, most impaired athlete racing for Canada. Mm. So for me, I had one of my teammates go first. Mm. He was first coming into the block when I had to go. And as soon as I like dove in, I could just hear all this crowd noise leading up, leading up, leading up to me diving in. And then as soon as I hit that water, it was silence. And that was one of the craziest experiences I've ever felt is just swimming under the water, trying to come up to the surface, but just in complete silence. And as soon as I broke the surface, I'm focused on my race, but I just hear what sounds like a jet engine just taking off the whole time that being that loud inside that stadium the whole entire time. How do you focus? I mean, I guess this is part of your training and you've, you know, done so many games and Olympics and how do you take that in? But also like, of course, like a positive, um, you know, reaction when they're clapping and cheering you on and how do you take that in but still focus and then it not be a pressure or do you use the pressure and use it as momentum to keep going and going past your limit versus like the other uh, when it's, you know, they're on home turf um, and the guy next to you and inside. Of course, you guys probably have this in mind. Like I watched the David Beckham documentary, like he talks about the experience of, you know, that and like, I watched it like all in one go I think it was when I was going to Paris last because I found it so fascinating like I do think there's something truly remarkable about like you know someone devoted to like one sport or two sports and they just want to take it to the nth degree going past all ideas and beliefs and you know and how you how it is to be on your home turf versus when you're not and then how do you use when you're not like the Brazil guy, like how does it, how do you not allow it to affect you? You know, like if I'm there and I just get, ah, yay. And dude next door, every, do you, do you use that energy to be like, let me show you what I can do? Or do you just, you're, you're focused on just doing the best you can and like forget about everything else? I think the biggest thing with that, and especially in a sport like swimming, uh, that I found and I'll, I'll, Mm -hmm. say my comparison between swimming and cycling in a second but mm -hmm. with swimming it's that lead up it's that lead up to everything and for me with Rio it was fun to be there mm -hmm. it, that was my gold medal was just being present mm -hmm. in Rio so did you just tell yourself that over and over again or you're just happy to be there and with it consuming yeah. and breathing this yeah. air and you're just, like I'm here like yeah. I'm just happy being here yeah it was just happy being there and it was so much fun just being in an environment like that because that at that time I was racing in the finals in day two and they've had a couple Brazilians racing at that point but that was the first time it just really became deafening in the pool it really became loud in there and all you could do in that moment was just enjoy it nothing's gonna magically change my feelings would never get hurt um, with like that kind of noise for someone else but also just knowing that you're in something as cool as this and having that presence of mind to be like okay 
I can, I'm still here to race, I'm still here to compete, but this is sweet. This is The world sweet. is watching. You're in another country yeah. on a different continent. You don't even speak the language. Yeah. And you know, the fact that if you like really look at it, like zoom out, yeah. Like how remarkable. It is. And so do your parents always travel with you? Uh, they, they made a couple trips. So mm -hmm. they were in Toronto in 2015 at the pair of Pan Am Games there, which was really cool because talking about crowds, we had a home crowd advantage there and getting to be able to race in front of Canadians at an event like that was just surreal. And just hearing the cheering that would go on for my teammates and even seeing the reactions that would come when a teammate won a medal, when a teammate won a gold, it became so invigorating that you wanted to experience it too. And for myself, I was very lucky. I won a bronze at the Parapanam Games in 2015. Thank you very much. And I was just over the moon celebrating, jumping up and down and trying to jump up and down in my lane as best you can in water. Uh, but as I got out of the pool, I could see my mom in the crowd just losing her mind. And it was just absolutely phenomenal to have my mom there and also have my dad, my brother, my sister there present. But they, um, since I transitioned from swimming to cycling, my parents have made it out to only a couple of my races, which still in itself is really remarkable. They were there for a couple races they did last year in 2023 in Italy and in Belgium and just having them there and having them being able to see me win a medal internationally was so cool and it was almost a gift there and um, even in 2024 if I do qualify my parents will be coming out there and knowing that they're there and knowing that this has been a journey because of them mm. is going to be something so special just to take part in what's been a time where in 2016 I thought I was going to be going to Tokyo in 2020 and mm. then being a swimmer in Paris 2024 but mm. so much changed in that meantime and where I didn't compete in Tokyo where I wasn't really doing a sport at the time I was starting cycling at that time but now a full eight years later after Rio I'm now hopefully going to Paris and hopefully having my parents come with me. We, I'm putting the energy behind you. May the force be with you, you know? Uh, yeah. How do you, I mean, of course there, I guess I can't really say it, like swimming, someone who doesn't swim. Um, how is it for you, um, you know, s cycling now versus swimming? Like, do you find it, earlier you were mentioning, how, you know, going around like North Shore, like around kits and your training and um, versus water, because of course water allows your body, you know, all the, you can do much more. You have more um, mobility or, you know, water. But now when you're on the bike, you're going places, clearing your head, whether it is for pleasure or for training. Yeah. How, 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 how is the feeling experience of cycling versus swimming for you? I, uh, there's so many similarities. Just with swimming, there's an amazing community. But with that community and also with swimming, it's not like you can communicate underwater to friends or teammates other than like an odd look or a head nod you give them. So there isn't that ability to really like talk and have that sense of community with people like outside of your team, outside of your club or outside of competitions you go to. But something I've really experienced with cycling, especially in Vancouver is because I ride a tricycle bike. So I have one wheel in the front, two wheels in the back. There's often so many times people have questions of why are you even on this thing? What's going on? Mm. What's happening? And that's almost an avenue to start a conversation, mm. an avenue to introduce someone to the world of para sport, but also what it means to be an athlete with a disability, but mm. also just as a person with disability, just trying to get the most out of their day. And it's funny, I used to ride a two wheel bike, but it was just uh, too unsafe for me at certain points. So I transitioned onto that trike. But even when I was riding a two wheel bike, I would have people come up to me, people start a conversation or even just start riding with me. And I'd have strangers join me for an hour, two hours, even a whole ride. And then we kind of reach our ends and we just say like, 
goodbye to each other. That's the last we ever see of that person. But that sense of community in cycling is so special and so unique because when you're able to open up with someone, they open up with you too. And you get to learn so much, hear some incredible stories as you probably agree with doing a lot of the community work that you do. Sometimes you'll go over to someone and you just start a conversation before you know it. This is the most interesting, the most fascinating person ever. And how open and how candid some people can be, it's really a gift mm -hmm. just to be able to have these kind of conversations. And with swimming, it's incredible, but there's barriers in that way, in a way. But with cycling, it's just being out on the road or being on a bike path or just being in a park. Mm -hmm. Before you know it, you, you could end up being there for 30, 40 minutes just talking to someone. And mm -hmm. it's crazy how small interactions go so far. Mm-hmm. And just like great for mental health too, to get out on a day like today yeah. or, you know, any day really. Like, um, so what has the prep for Paris been like for you for the Paris Summer Olympics, uh, Paralympics? Uh, what, how long is, for those who don't know, you know, how long does the training look like for you? How, when did you start prepping for this? So I first got into cycling in 2020 and kind of I didn't really know what to expect fully with my Paralympic journey just because getting into a brand new sport you don't want to be thinking okay I can go to a games in x amount of years but slowly as things started to develop and I got onto a trike bike I realized that okay I have some fundamental skills that are helping me right now and really helping my progression now with the last couple of years i started riding a trike in actually june of 2022 so i've come up on two years of being a trike rider now mm. and in 2022 i raced for canada for the first time internationally but in 2023 i was very fortunate to win a world championship in uh in, in my main event the time trial and that was something that I thought I could do, but I thought it was a few years away mm -hmm. at that point. And just winning that didn't like give me a guaranteed kind of lock for the games, mm -hmm. but kind of made me feel like, okay, things are going right, but this isn't a time to rest. This is not a time to relax. You still have so much work to do just to even get to these games and get to this opportunity. So pretty well from winning the uh, World Championship in August of 2023, I made sure I took some time off the bike just to let myself go through the emotions of actually doing something as crazy as winning one of those things and then slowly building my way back into the bike because these are long seasons, these yeah. are long years. So when you won this championship, like where was it and what does that look like? So, like, what, how, like, how long did you ride for? Like, t tell us about that. So, uh, in cycling, there is uh, world championships that happen every year. Just so happened last year, we did something called Super Worlds. Mm. So, we had pretty well every single cycling discipline all in one city or an all in one region of Scotland, uh, Glasgow. Uh, we were down, the paracycling was down in Dumfries, which is about 45 minutes south of. Uh, Glasgow and just being in an environment like that being in a smaller town it was super cool the community came out for the event but in my race in particular just because I'm in the trike category and with my condition I'm I'm able to go for rides but my body kind of breaks down quicker than other people's would so in my class our distances are usually a little shorter Mm -hmm. So it was only 11.8 kilometers, which is still a long distance mm -hmm. in cycling in general, but for our racing is quite short. Mm -hmm. So we started off in like the town center of Dumfries, uh, Scotland, left the town and then just on open farm roads for a while. First half was just climbing out of the town. And then the second half was mostly downhill coming back into the town, but in cycling, there's a couple of prestigious jerseys that you can win and wear. Obviously, everyone knows about the Tour de France mm -hmm. and the yellow jersey and the polka dot jersey for the mountain climbers. But for world championships, they have something called the rainbow jersey. 
So if you win the rainbow jersey, if you win a world championship, you get to be the wearer of the rainbow for the next year till the next world championships. So winning the rainbow jersey, I was able to one get my own rainbow jersey which i've hung up in my apartment and i also you're like i don't even wear it it's like in in framed (laughs) it's it's a white it's a white jersey which i know i'm gonna like dirty at some point so it's like i need to keep that away from me at all costs (laughs) but um being able to have a title like that is something so special because so many people helped me earn that Mm. and even with that is I feel, and I know some other athletes who have won it feel, it is a responsibility to have a title like that, is to help mm-hmm. others get to that point too. So mm-hmm. kind of throughout, like this year you were asking about the Paralympic journey of what it's like leading into uh, Paris. Mm-hmm. It has been a lot of work around helping myself train, but also setting up pathways and setting up foundations where I'm very lucky that I'm hopefully going to Paris in... 40 days time and racing for Canada, but also setting up a path where we can have another world champion, where we can have another rainbow jersey wearer, but, and also other athletes who get to go to the games, say in LA in 2028 or Brisbane in 2032 or wherever it's going to be in 2036. Hopefully Vancouver. Hopefully Vancouver (laughs) or something, hopefully Canada. Yeah. Um, But... Uh, Tell us a bit about the training. Like, are you training five days a week? Like, how many hours a day? You know, what what does training look like? What what are you doing? So for me, actually training, less is more with my condition. Mm -hmm. uh, Because with my disability, I have dystonia, which is very similar to cerebral palsy in a lot of ways. With fatigue and with exhaustion, my body starts to break down. Like, I won't be able to control my left arm. I will get little bits of brain fog here and there. So it can be very difficult for me to go hammer out 20 hours on the bike per se. But what I can do is utilize a certain amount of training hours I do have. So doing a lot of kind of like light, easy, what we call endurance riding Mm -hmm. around Vancouver where I'm not going crazy hard the whole time, but I'm going at a pace that I can control if I was to ride for five hours plus I could I could hold just building my physical capabilities and my stamina levels and my endurance levels but doing a couple rides like that but also doing another couple rides where I am pushing myself Mm. where I am trying to figure out what is my max maximum kind of oxygen levels that I can handle or where how far can I push my body and being in a place like Vancouver it's very very good to have the rolling hills and the mountains and even the oceans that we have here because it's all unique kind of challenges that bring out all different parts of your day so it's very much learning how to control your riding but also not being afraid of pushing yourself beyond the limits so right now i usually ride four to five times a week and do a couple gym sessions in between the week and then give myself like a day off Hmm. once a week or once every two weeks just to let my body decompress and let my condition recover so I can hit that next week harder I can hit the next couple weeks as hard as I did before Hmm. when I hear I'm very always curious about hearing athlete interviews you know whether the ones who are retired or even listening to their audiobooks or you know someone like David Beckham or anyone and I find it very fascinating that how they use visualization mm-hmm. um, you know I had Jay Demerit here who is the former captain of Whitecaps and he mentioned that how because he's American of course he's been living in Canada for many years now and he mentioned going to the UK to represent his country and he had this eye injury and that resulted him not leaving a dark room for like I think six weeks or eight weeks and his whole career for him was like riding on this and the whole time he's just visualizing if this person does this this is what I'm gonna do this is how I'm gonna is that some do you guys do something like that like visualize like being in Paris you know being on your bike going through the city what is the road going to what are the what are the obstacles that you're gonna overcome 
I mean, at least like in the books that I've read on power of subconscious mind, they talk a lot about how athletes that in sports, they use this a lot to visualize that they win off the field even before they win in real life. Yeah. It's crazy how important visualization is in the first place. So in swimming, there would be a thing that we would do, especially leading into competitions, where, for example, I would my main event was the 50 meter butterfly. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the training workouts I would do in the water would be mm. four, four times of 50 meters as fast as I can go or at certain speeds or certain paces. But as I got closer and closer to competitions, they would want us visualizing and I would visualize those sets, those workouts, and even not like in a practice facility, but at the pool, mm -hmm. at the stadium, at the event. And what would happen actually is the first time you would do it, you would visualize, say for example, yourself getting up on the blocks, starting diving into the water, doing your first couple strokes and going from there and it'd be about- Is it like in a meditative state or how are you doing that? Sort of like a meditative state or even okay. just like lying down, giving yourself some time leading into it just to relax, turn the brain off, just so you're not worrying about other distractions that maybe have been going on before. But sort of, for example, my butterfly, I got my time down to about 33 seconds. So when you first usually started doing it, your times would be about way off, but maybe like 10, 15 seconds off. But the more and more you practice it, the more and more closer you got to the actual time that you were targeting mm. or times that you would go in previous races. And now with a sport like cycling, 50 meters versus 14k is a bit of a difference and remembering a 14 kilometer course versus a, or even like a longer course can be a little trickier here and there but try to visualize important aspects like for example if I qualify for Paris there is a couple very crucial areas for me a couple climbs that are very important for me to target and for me to hit as well as a corner a couple corners I need to make sure that I get dialed in so I visualized it, I pictured what it's going to be like going up there because I was lucky enough to ride the course last year so I know what it looks like. So where is it? Where it, is it? It's in Sienne, Saint Denis. Okay. Oh, Saint Denis. Saint Denis, yeah. Saint Denis. Okay, so like Saint Saint Denis? Sienne, Saint Denis, yeah. Okay, Saint Denis, like uh, my first apartment in Paris was Strasbourg Saint Denis. Okay. Okay, so when I first went there, I was like, Saint Denis, and all the French, they're like, those oh, are so American. I'm like, no, I'm Canadian. But, um, so if it's Saint Denis, it's out outside Paris. Yeah, a little it, bit. A yeah, little, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay, it does. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so it also goes through a town, and I might mispronounce the name, like Cordoy, or Cordoy or something. I, I, I don't know where exactly, but you're kind of really on the outskirts of the city, but also you also start slowly getting closer and closer to the city. So there is, and I remember it vividly just because it's at a very crucial part of the course. And on one of my first rides there, for example, right before you go down the hill to get like really in the heart of the city or hard in the part of Saint Saint Denis uh, mm -hmm. that you're in, you can see like the Disneyland in the distance. You can see the Eiffel Tower. You can see the downtown core in the distance. And obviously on the race day, you're not going to be thinking about that, but just knowing those sites and having those recognitions of when you are doing visual training, for example, that can be really good in road cycling to be like, okay, I have this little section coming up here and you're thinking about it mentally, you're thinking about it visually, and then you have that little cue spot and that can help you retain, okay, what's coming up here? Do I have a corner here? Yes, I do. Let's visualize what that corner looks like. How do I want to take that corner? And it really helps you, as you said, prepare, plan, and execute your race before you even get there. But uh, having that chance last year to see the course and see the area that it's in is just phenomenal and just very, very special. Just even seeing the farm fields on one side, but also seeing the city in another area of the, in the distance is just special. It's just mm, very special. Remarkable. It, it's um, it's another world. Yeah. You know, it's all these buildings. Are, the building I lived in, the last one in Paris, on Avenue Clébert, and two blocks away from Trocadero, uh, where this area is, 
and then I would come out of my building and on the left would be Arc de Triomphe but it's um, like I don't know 15 blocks but you can see it as soon as you get out and um, you know the building I was in you, you, you see it it's like since 1889 you know they're not like seven years old building like this one over yeah. here so I feel like what you shared about visualization you know it's just so remarkable because um, not just athletes like anyone who's watching um, and I feel like you like verbalizing this and sharing your story with me is just inspiring me for me even though I'm just going to attend and view and document the Olympics in Paris and you are as well to participate but even for someone like myself to you know I when things started shifting for me going getting out of the fear state into it's going to go well and trusting more and leaning into that good things do happen and um, you know going through the feelings and then just something it was almost like the dial turned right you know before it's on this side like and you know even getting to the airport like now it, there used to be a time where I was always running late and I'm just like now like no I will go with plenty of time because I want that peace and serenity I want the experience to be calm so even when you were asking me earlier like how do you decompress like when I'm walking with Loki the other day I just chose to not put in my airpods because I was like okay it's I'm just it's gonna be a very calm experience I'm going to enjoy it there will be moments where I'm just like wah but I'm breathing I'm present I'm here because I know when I'm in that still space which what you guys experience so much more that that's when the magic happens that's where the miracles the synchronicities yeah. happen without detachment without like um, sorry without attachment just like detaching to the results yeah. that's why I'm going to Paris on a one-way trip ticket because I'm like anything can happen <laughs> in Paris who knows yeah. who knows anything can happen before I let you go I do want to talk a bit about your advocacy work that you're doing you know um, not just for you know, athletes, but for other humans, you know, who have disabilities, not just from the work you're doing as a Paralympian, but also media work, which was so fascinating to me because not like your plate isn't full, like when do you sleep, when do you breathe, when do you eat? Yeah, you went to broadcasting school, you went to go study, what inspired that? So always You're coming after my job. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're coming after mine. <laughs> Got competition here. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> no, like always as a kid, I I don't know what it is. You kind of get attracted to something at, at young ages. Really, who knows what it is fully, but my dad would have us watch hockey as a kid and I always had a dream of doing like play-by-play -play in the NHL, but sooner and later, as I got older in life, I realized this world of parasport I had here doesn't really have the media coverage. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't even know about the Paralympics or know about any para activity until someone actually mentioned it to me. And kind of as I got older, that started to resonate with me more and more and more. And actually, when I graduated high school, I went to a university to study communication so I could get into media to learn how to, the side of journalism, the side of broadcasting. But at that time, it was not right for me. Mm. And as I kind of went through my swimming career, and as my swimming career kind of came to an end, I did a massive backpacking trip going around the world. And at that time, I started chasing different dreams, different goals around cycling and even trying to bike around the world at one point, all in the way of, I want to show what can be done with people with disabilities. What can you do when you step out of that comfort zone, when you go beyond what you think is possible? And as I kept thinking about that bike ride, I also was like, I want to film it. I want to broadcast it. I want to document it. And I was thinking to myself is, I want to learn the skills to help myself be able to tell my story, but also other people's stories too. So as my cycling bike packing journey started, my journalism story 
restarted again too. So I went to BCIT to the part-time program there just because I had to focus on some work stuff to help be able to afford living in Vancouver, let alone mm. trying to afford the bikes and the equipment that comes with that. So welcome to the club. Yeah. I'm like <laughs> always working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As many people even probably listening know yeah. and watching know that it's, there's the challenges of living in like a beautiful city like this, but mm -hmm. also having a dream, having a passion like that of documenting, of sharing stories. There's other challenges that come with it too. And kind of as my journalism journey kind of ended at school and I finished my program, I wanted to figure out, okay, what can I do next? And what is possible out there? And I wanted to cover Paralympic sport. So I reached out to a network called Accessible Media Inc. Mm -hmm. AMI for short. They had a uh, apprenticeship with, uh, for people with disabilities to get involved and I ended up working with an amazing producer, an amazing videographer and editor who just took me in, gave me a ton of experience and gave me the chance to write uh, different stories and what's so different about AMI, especially from different journalism schools, is when you write a story, when you tell a story, when you even storyboard, you have to think in the perspective of all viewers with accessible needs. So how you show someone moving is gonna be very different for someone who has a visual impairment. So mm -hmm. being able to write it in a way that kind of makes everyone feel included in the story. Like mm -hmm. everyone knows kind of like, for example, that person grabs the glass. Well, you can't say like, oh, that person goes for a drink. You have to describe, okay, the motion, the movements. Like Nathan gra uses his right arm to grab the glass and pours the tea into his mouth and sort of describe it in a way that gives detail that kind of flourishes the story. And for me, doing that really kind of showed different accessibility needs. And I started out writing for a couple shows, uh, covering para-athletes and para-sports that eventually evolved and grew into a weekly para-sport update show where I get the privilege to and honor to talk about friends, about teammates, and share their successes and share their experiences once a week about, say, for example, a volleyball team winning a tournament in the Netherlands or a basketball team going on a series of friendlies over in Europe or even just right now with the Paralympics 40 days away telling the stories of all these athletes getting to qualify for their third, their fifth, their sixth, or even their first games. And they have that little digital footprint now of their name being included in a news story and having that. them having their story attached to something even bigger. And it's just small little things like that that make a huge difference at the end of the day. And even another, sh another show I do with AMI where I'm a community reporter, so I get to cover community events or get to tell people about community events. But I get to have a unique perspective where I got to think about, okay, how can wheelchair users get access to this? Is there going to be seating at this event for someone who may need... Uh, time to sit down, may need time to relax, and maybe can't be able to walk long distances like someone else can. Will they be able to sit down, or are there auditory needs that you need to take into effect, or visual needs that you need to really think about for a lot of the stuff in the community? So with that media work I get to do right now, it's kind of showed me, it's like, okay, there's ways to broadcast, there's ways to tell people's stories, there's ways to make media accessible for everyone. And that's and there's some so many beautiful ways of telling that and in and there's so many incredible stories like you probably can say from a lot of the stories you've covered of other people or just other events you've been at just you meet a unique person and it's like wow this person's incredible but i think what you're doing is is you're using your platform to highlight you know and you're probably some little kid or an adult needs to see that you know where you come from where you are now and that this is possible yeah. you know, how this how you've defied all these odds you know something that comes to my mind is like the hero's journey like you i'm sure there have been days that you know for you correct me if i'm wrong where sometimes even getting out of bed can be challenging yeah. whether it's physically or emotionally yeah. but continuing to go and when you're working for a purpose yeah. that is bigger than you 
it gives you the fire to keep going. Yeah. When your mission is bigger than yourself, more than your pride, because I think the work you're doing is to be of service, to help others, to pave a path, so others can see there's you when they watch this show, yeah. when we when they watch you know your other show or like your social media presence, a reflection. Like I can relate, but in in a different manner. It's like not seeing people like me on in media when I was growing yeah. up or in television. Yeah. So kids and adults, they need to hear these stories. Yeah. And even for myself, sitting down with you and you sharing with so much poise your story is just, it's just really like, it touches my heart and it moves me because I think you are on a mission and I feel like when you're working on something that is bigger than you, it's more service mindset than right people, situation, people, places, things, everything aligns, you know, then the impossible does become possible, which is road to Paris. Yeah, yeah. Patty, yeah. Patty. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, because we do have someone else who's going to be ringing, but we're on Do Not Disturb. Um, I do, I would like to know, what inspires you? Wow. I think the big thing that inspires me and kind of what motivates me is being someone with a disability and kind of going my whole life, this is who I am, I can't change this, and I've had to play the cards the way I can best and having to be adaptable and in that life I've had so many people who have selflessly given support to me given time to me and help educate me show me what I can do with my condition what I can do with my disability to reach my dreams and reach my goals because and this is something I say about parasport all the time is especially how we started out started out the Stoke Manville games for people who suffered injuries in World War II and that gave them a chance to be active, to rehab, to rebuild and just the generations of things that para-athletes before us have gone through. There was a time where they weren't being paid, they'd have to pay for their own equipment and the cost of equipment are absolutely astronomical, especially back in the day too or wasn't even covered on different networks or there wouldn't be news stories, but these people paved the way for us mm -hmm. and gave us these opportunities to succeed, to really thrive and really get these opportunities and get these chances to trailblaze in different ways too. And now it's our role and it's our opportunity to help that next generation succeed and help mm -hmm. that next generation really become household names, become that opportunity to get the sponsorships they desire, but also live fulfilling lives and help that little kid and help that little kid in themselves, but also the little kid in the community. Because one of the, one of the greatest gifts about being a paracyclist and about being able to ride in Vancouver is not the scenery. It's not all the different cafes I get to experience. It's when I'm out for a ride, I have a parent come up to me being like, Hey, my son or daughter, had a stroke, they have limited motion of so, so rare, or they're just going through a rehab right now of some sort. And I want to know, how did you get your bike? How did you get connected in this community? Or how, what's the right way to help my son or help my daughter find something they love? And just them having that confidence to come up to me and have those conversations mean the world, because I hope to connect and help that next generation really succeed, really reach their dreams. And it's funny how this started out because people helped me. Mm. And now I want to make sure I help others. Then who knows, those other people are going to help that next generation after them. And it's that cycle mm -hmm. that's just never ending of giving, getting, and then giving back. Mm -hmm. Getting and then giving back. And we are so lucky to be where we are now and often no matter what it is, we will find ways to complain about this, complain about that, but change is the only way to make it happen and make it possible. So it's just doing that work. It's taking that time now to help someone down the road that may not even, you may not even see the fruits of your labor at this point, but knowing that that work is going to something special and trailblazing and creating and 
creating a new path as something that you probably agree with too in all of your journey and all of things you've gone through you're creating a path for yourself but also for others mm -hmm. in that in that way too and that is something so special and for me just knowing hopefully that I can I can help one person would mean the world and you are and you are you know and I think it's I do believe in the power of conversation and storytelling and human beings coming together opening up and you know perhaps someone watching this you know will be moved by this uh, whether they are an individual with disability or not because your story is a story of resilience and a story of hope and I really appreciate you taking the time of sticking out we had some technical difficulties so, you know to be honest this show we've been doing since October before that we did another show which was just the whole phone business um, but I normally have someone behind the scenes and this week I'm just like on my own doing the things and this is the first time I've ever like had this happen to me but I really appreciate your patience coming here and I do think that people are going to find this truly inspiring and I know we're going to stay in touch and I have I have a very strong feeling you're going to Paris regardless um, I think you're on a great path and I truly appreciate you coming here and opening up and sharing your story. Nathan Clement, Nathan Clement, merci beaucoup, monsieur, merci. And soon you'll be in Paris and you okay. can ask, bonjour monsieur, bonjour madame, un, co un croissant s'il vous plaît. Un croissant s'il vous plaît. Yeah, not croissant. How, croissant? Yeah, or <laughs> oh, how do people say it here? Croissant? Yes, or croissant, croissant. And I said <laughs> croissant. Okay, I'm probably not even saying it the perfect way because I'm, not the um, I don't even speak French but apparently it's easier for someone like me to pronounce than someone who's native English speaker oh, okay. because my language my native language is different so okay. yeah so anyways I so appreciate you and thank you all for watching for tuning in I will share Nathan's information so you can get in touch with him follow him on social media and we're sending him all the good vibes for Paris Paralympic Summer 2024. Paris is the city of lights, love, and fashion, the city of dreams. You know, until next time, I'm your host, Zara Durrani. The show is produced with the support of Tell a Story Hive. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Zara. My pleasure.